Hey everyone, welcome to Logan Smosh Pick. Glad to have you here. Do me a favor and please subscribe if you haven't already. Today we're going to do another episode of the Memory Lane series. In this series, we're going to take a look back at some interesting articles and interviews from old guitar magazines. My dad has been collecting guitar magazines for about 30 years now. He saved a bunch of them. He was kind enough to let me borrow some. So the one we're going to look at today is the November 1991 issue of Guitar World magazine. Here's the cover. Guitar god Jimi Hendrix <laughs> is about to get grilled in a rare 1968 interview. Jay Ruby initiated the interview. Now move over Rover and let Jimmy take over. Is the musical scene in England different from that of the United States? Well, yes it is. It's a little more together so far as the musicians are concerned. They all know each other and everybody congregates around London, but it's not that much different really. They have their own scene and we've got our own scene over here. Do you prefer it over there? As a musician, not necessarily. I like to jam a lot and they don't do that much. Do you feel like the trio form is the best for your music? We set out to be a trio. That's the reason why we are like this. We tried to incorporate an organist for about 15 minutes and it didn't work out. It made us sound like everybody else. But the trio format isn't ideal. It just happened like that. Do you enjoy smashing your instruments on stage? Not really. There are times when we do it. We play millions and millions of gigs and we smash our instruments maybe three or four times. But it was just because we felt like it. It might have been because we had some personal problems. You do it because you're angry? Yeah, it's probably because we're worked up on something, you know? How does it feel? Oh, it's a feeling like you feel very frustrated and the music gets louder and louder. You start thinking about different things and all of a sudden, crash, bang, eventually it goes up in smoke. Do you think about it ahead of time? No, we wouldn't be able to get that together. We did it once before and somebody said, that's great, why don't you plan it out? Plan what out? It just happens, that's all. Who among other guitarists do you most admire? Well, it's very hard to say, but as far as the blues scene goes, some of the things that Albert King and Eric Clapton do are very good. I don't have any favorites. It's very hard because there are so many different styles and it's so bad to put everybody in the same bag. Whom do you listen to? I like to listen to anybody, so long as they don't bore me. I tend toward the blues as far as guitar players are concerned. I also like things from Rowan Kirk and The Mothers. A lot of people compare you to Eric Clapton. That's one thing I don't like. Sometimes the notes might sound like we're alike, but it's a completely different scene between those notes. First they do that, then they expect me to play blues exclusively. We just say we don't want to play blues all the time. We just don't feel like it all the time. You see, there are other things we can play too. Nice songs or different things. Some artists have difficulty making the transition from concerts to records. Do you see the experience as primarily a live or a studio group? You can dig it either as a record or in person. Like, some want to hear things you can't do live when you make a record. You have to put a certain sound in the record of a certain little freaky thing. Like the sound of raindrops reversed and echoed and faded and all that. But the main thing is the words and they can feel the other thing and not necessarily hear it. Things change so quickly in today's music. For instance, what you did on your second album is different from what you did on the first. Yes, we noticed that after we listened to it. So the change from the first to the second album wasn't conscious? We tried to make a change. You fix your life and say, well, we're going to do this next time. We get ideas, groovy ideas, you know. Everything's a natural progression. I don't know. I might not be here tomorrow, so I'm doing what I'm doing now. The music seems to be evolving so rapidly. I'd feel guilty if we did something like the Chuck Berry scene, using the same background for every single song. That shows that you're going in the word scene. Anybody who's hungry, anybody that's young and wants to get into music, has got to go into so many different bags. They've got so much to be influenced by, so many different things in the world. Does that only apply to the young? Not necessarily, no. I mean, young ideas. Being hungry is not necessarily being hungry for food. So it's going to keep changing? Well, maybe. Maybe we'll settle down. 
You just don't want to put a lot of junk on top of it, like violins for certain numbers unless it calls for it. When you record, who does the effects? All those things are in our own minds. All those things come out of us. Like, we use something called phasing on the last track of Axis Bold as Love. It makes a sound like planes going through your membranes and chromosomes. A cat got that together accidentally, and he turned us onto it. That's the sound we wanted. It was a special sound. We didn't want to use tapes or airplanes. We wanted to have the music itself warped. Do you arrange your music before you record? Oh yes, we have ideas in our minds, and then we add to them. Let's get back to an earlier topic. How do you define the blues? You can have your own blues. Folk blues are not necessarily the only type of blues in the world. I heard some Irish folk songs that were so funky, like words and the feel were so together. That was a great scene. We have our own type of blues scene. We do this blues called If Six Were Nine. That's what you call a great feeling of blues. We don't even try to give it a name. Everybody has some kind of blues to offer, you know? What about the white slash black scene? Is white blues really the blues? Well, I'll tell you. Bloomfield's band, the Paul Butterfield Blues Band, is ridiculously out of sight. You can feel what they're doing no matter what color their eyes or armpits might be. Like, I said to myself, okay, they've got this white cat down in the village playing harmonica, really funky. So, we all went down to the village and then, wow, he turned me on so much, I said, look at that. He was really deep into it and nobody could touch him there because he was in his own little scene. He was really so happy. I don't care. Like I said before, it all depends on how much your ears are together and how your mind is and where your ears are. They say that in England they don't make those distinctions. It's only sound that matters what color you are. We've still got that hang up here. It isn't really a hang up because human beings are dumb sided anyway. You know, countries to me are just like little kids playing with different toys. America is a little boy. But all these countries will soon grow up. There's so much happening in music, especially if you have an open mind, because, as we all know, music is art. Well, that's the end of the interview with who is almost universally considered to be the greatest guitarist who ever lived. Let me know what you guys thought of the Jimi Hendrix interview in the comments. That does it for today's video, guys. I hope you enjoyed. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't already. I really appreciate the support. I'll see you next time. Until then, rock on.